My name is Emily, and today we're going to be going over 25 life-changing drawing and painting tips. And yes, when I say life-changing, I actually mean it. Most of these tips have completely changed the way that I make art. So if you want to learn about some tips you may not have heard anywhere else before, then definitely stay tuned. But before we get into this video, here is a quick word from today's sponsor. Today's video was sponsored by New Amino Stories. First of all, if you don't have an Amino account, I highly recommend you head on over and get one. Amino is more than an app. It's a community of communities. As an Amino user, you can join as many individual user-run communities as you like. It's all about connecting like-minded people. What's even more awesome is that Amino has rolled out a brand new feature, Amino Stories. This really gives users a chance to be more creative and to be more interactive with their followers. You can search for a key phrase up in the search bar, narrow it down by selecting topics, select a topic you're most interested in, and voila, an endless stream of entertainment. You can check out some of the stories I've posted by searching for Emily Artful under the Users tab and following me. My username is, of course, at Emily Artful. I recently found another watercolor creator who makes amazing work. Her name's Calliope Liviaki. She makes these incredibly dynamic watercolor paintings. I definitely recommend you guys go check out her stories and give her a follow. There are just so many unique creators creating so many unique stories on this platform. So make Make sure to download Amino and start your story today. Tip number one. Are you confused about how to really use a kneaded eraser? I mean, it's just a hunk of dough, right? Wrong! Here are three quick mini tips to get you started. 1A, the ideal shape for a kneaded eraser is in the shape of a cone with a rounded bottom. Kind of like a little birdie head. Ooh, tweet, tweet, tweet. You can use the beak, the pointed part of the eraser, to erase small details, and you can use the bigger end, the head, to erase larger areas. Tip 1B. You can use your kneaded eraser to pull excess graphite off your sketch, leaving a much lighter image behind. This is great if you have a problem with graphite mudding your finished artwork. Tip 1C. It's super easy to clean a kneaded eraser. Unlike white erasers where you either need to cut a chunk off or aggressively rub it against a matchbox or nail file, all you need to do to clean your kneaded eraser is to knead it. Pound the dough! Tip number two. Don't have a kneaded eraser to try out the previous tips? No problem. Blue tack, or that mysterious stretchy stuff that's in the back of your utility drawer, can be used just like a kneaded eraser. Though I recommend you eventually get a real kneaded eraser, the benefit to blue tack is that it is a lot firmer, making the dough hold its shape a lot longer. The white blue tack works the best as it doesn't contain any dyes that may potentially stain your artwork. Make sure to do a test patch before using it on an actual finished piece. Tip number three. Tired of getting graphite smudges all over your paper while you're sketching? Use a piece of parchment paper underneath your hand to prevent it from picking up the graphite. This also prevents the side of your palm from getting that, like, unsightly blue-gray shine. Like, you're turning into a post-mortem smurf. Would the smurf death now be like, na 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 bong, na 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 <laughs> bong. <laughs> Oh my god. Tip number four. This is a bit of an extension of tip number three, but use clean pieces of parchment or tissue paper in between the pages of your sketchbook to prevent sketches from rubbing off on one another. This is especially helpful if you like working in graphite and charcoal one minute, but then you'd like to switch to ink, markers, another. It keeps your sketchbook looking nice and clean instead of like a dusty ass mess. Tip number five. Do your ink outlines fade after you erase the sketch underneath? This happens because you are trying to erase over wet ink. Just because the ink may look dry doesn't mean it's dry all the way through the paper. To prevent this from happening, use a heat gun or a hair dryer to completely dry your lines. Using heat helps quickly penetrate down into the paper in order to fully dry the ink. If you don't have either tools, let your art air dry overnight before you try to erase. This tip will leave you with beautiful crisp line work with a deep black color. Tip number six. Different levels of water saturation create different blooming effects while using the wet and wet watercolor technique. Look at how differently these samples look as the paint moves through them. This is obviously also going to depend on your watercolors and how willing they are to bloom. So make sure you know how your paints behave before applying this technique to a finished piece. Remember, water will flow where other water is. So the more water that is placed down, the farther your pigment will travel. The drier the spot, the more restricted your pigment's movement will be. Tip number seven. 
Never leave your paintbrushes soaking in water for long periods of time. Yes, even your acrylic brushes. I know there are hearts breaking, but please hear me out. Over time, the water that has been absorbed through the bristles will begin to erode the glue that holds them in place, and that will eventually give you frayed and shedding brushes. I know how tempting it is to just set it and forget it, so to speak, but it will end up costing you a lot more money in the long run. My advice is to clean your brush in two separate containers of water water and leave it laying on its side while you work. Once you're all done and ready to pack up for the night, then tip number eight, you can clean your brushes with some brush cleaner or alternatively some baby shampoo, dry and shape them with a paper towel and then leave them hanging upside down to completely dry overnight. This encourages any water to run down toward the tips of the bristles instead of building up in the ferrule, which would happen if you were to let your brushes dry upright. Pretty much just don't ever let a wet brush dry sitting upright. It's a big no-no in everybody's book. Tip number nine, do not thin your acrylic paints with water. This is because when you thin acrylic paint with water, the molecules in the paint binder become farther and farther apart, then weakening the paint and making it harder for the acrylic to bond to a surface long term. This then causes the paint to crack and flake off over time. Use an appropriate acrylic thinning medium instead, and you'll end up with much nicer looking results that are built to last. Tip number 10, having a hard time drawing a straight line? No problem. Try looking at the final point of your line as you draw instead of following your pencil with your eyes. This helps your brain visualize where the line is going, which will help you automatically draw it straighter. Thank you, Mr. C, from my freshman geometry class. I appreciate it, and I'm very sorry I remembered absolutely nothing else that you taught me. Tip number 11. Does your line art look too heavy for your watercolor painting? This is a lesson that absolutely blew my mind. Lay your watercolors down over your sketch before you add any black line work. This helps you you figure out exactly what line width will suit your painting the best. It's that simple. Tip number 12. Do you feel like your artwork is too stiff? Use what is called a line of action to help establish the flow of a composition. You can not only use it for a human figure, but you can also use it for animal figures, plants, horizons, etc, etc. It's essentially the most bare bones part of your artwork, but it helps establish movement before you even begin drawing. Tip number 13. Are you still in the process of learning color theory? Create a basic color wheel and have it taped in front of your workspace. This will provide a quick reference for when you get stuck mixing colors. Never underestimate the power of a simple chit Nope. Cheat cheat. Chit chit. <laughs> Tip number 14. Make sure your hands are completely clean before you start to work on a piece. Yes, this means free of lotion as well. It hurts me too. Excess oil from your hands can create a barrier between your medium and your paper. If you're working on dirty paper with something like watercolors, you'll end up with a bunch of patches that won't absorb the pigment because the oil isn't allowing the water to penetrate. So put the chips down and wash your nasty hands. Tip number 15. When working with gouache or watercolor, use the very point of your brush to soak up excess water. This will help you lay down even amounts of pigment opposed to creating unwanted blooms or harsh edges. This technique has a pretty steep learning curve, so make sure you practice it regularly. Tip number 16. Even if you buy a canvas in the store that says it already has gesso on it, don't trust no b****. Add one or two additional layers of gesso before starting your painting. Inexpensive canvases, especially ones that you can buy in bulk, typically have a very thin, unreliable coat of gesso on them. They are prepared in a factory and not gessoed by hand. Play it safe and take the time to add a coat or two with love. Tip number 17. Are your watercolor or gouache tubes totally dried up inside? Don't freak out just yet. You can cut them open, remove the hardened pigment, cut it up, and reuse the pieces just like people. Because these two paints are water-based, they can always be reactivated using water. In my opinion, though they are expensive, they are the most cost-effective type of paints because when acrylics dry up, you're shit out of luck. Tip number 18. If you really can't stand the feeling of chalk pastels on your fingers, like literally 90% of the population, have I got an alternative for you. You can use makeup brushes to apply chalk pastel to a drawing. The looser the bristles, the lighter the application. The denser the bristles, the thicker the application. 
It's a great way to create a unique piece of artwork without making a huge mess. One time when I was little, I was using chalk on a chalkboard and I was getting like heebie-jeebies, like the shiver feeling you get going up your back. And I got it so much that I felt like I was going to throw up. So it made me like not want to touch chalk. True story. Tip number 19. Keeping multiple sketchbooks is a great way to diversify your artistic skills. You can keep one purely for that Cal Arts flip through aesthetic kind of purpose, one for anatomy, one for landscapes, and so on and so forth. Don't let anyone tell you what a sketchbook can or can't be. It's 100% up to you. And if anyone tries to give you sass, they can shove it up the buttholes. I don't think the algorithm can catch bee holes when I'm singing it, so. <laughs> That's what I've been doing. Tip number 20. Are you really struggling with one part of your composition? Try turning off all other background noise or investing in some noise canceling headphones. It's easier for our brain to focus at the task at hand when there aren't too many distractions in the room. I know a lot of us love to have music or Netflix going in the background as we work and that's fine. But if you're really trying to get something just right or work on something that's really important, I definitely suggest trying to unplug and focus in. Tip number 21. When drawing realistic remember that harsh lines do not actually occur in nature. Instead, use soft lines to establish your sketch and then build around them using shading. Eventually, the lines will disappear altogether, creating a much more natural gradient. This will create the illusion of definition without creating a harsh edge. Tip number 22. Is it ever possible to polish a piece too much? Yes. It literally is. Well, isn't that just a swift kick in the pants for you? Mommy, look, I made a good painting. Oh, little Jimmy, it is good. But it's too good, take it back. <laughs> Overworking a piece, especially when working with paints, can cause a painting to become muddy or unusually smooth, making it look a bit strange. Instead, try to leave some painterly strokes in your piece, which will allow the medium to show through. However, there is a fine balance that takes time to learn, lest you... Tip number 23. Underwork your piece. Underworking, I, it's, a, it's a big f you, I, I really know it is. Underworking typically occurs when an artist feels like their painting isn't going in the right direction. Either there's been a few pitfalls that have frustrated the artist, the medium isn't cooperating with them, or they simply feel the art itself is not good. This may sound like the most generic piece of advice ever, but please don't give up just yet. Try adding a different medium, using ink outlines, adding more detail. Try something, anything. I can't stress how important it is to keep working on an artwork, even when you feel it's gone to crap. You never know what small choice could turn it all around. Underworking also occurs when an artist says, I'm done but it's not like really done. The terms overworking and underworking are typically used in a classroom kind of academic setting by teachers who are just trying to get you to get a feel of what a finished piece looks like. Tip number 24. If you really enjoy the way someone colors their artwork, the best way to emulate that is to try and copy it exactly. Now, before anyone thinks I'm promoting art theft, let me be clear that this is for personal use only. Use your reference as a way to study, not as a way to get attention. I suggest just keeping it off social media, and if you absolutely just have to post it, make it abundantly clear that it is a study of someone else's work, linking to that person's page. But I just recommend keeping it off social media altogether, that way there is zero confusion about whose artwork it is, and you can use it for your personal benefit and call it a day. But to get the feel for how someone else colors their artwork, try copying it down to the very stroke of the brush. I find that oftentimes in the process of doing this, you will develop your own way of shading that will produce a similar result. I recommend starting out with some of the old master's works, taking a small, tiny little piece of the painting, copying it, pasting it onto Photoshop, and start to paint alongside of it. This is a great way to learn a whole host of artistic skills, and it's encouraged in practically every single art university across the world. And finally, tip number 25, I hope I don't disappoint you guys, here are a few rapid fire quote unquote mini tips all about common drawing mistakes to close out the video. Tip 25A, eyelashes don't go straight out and up like a Barbie doll. They crisscross and sometimes go against the grain. Tip 25B, noses don't actually come to a sharp point. If you're struggling to make your noses look slightly more realistic, remember to curve the tip of the nose. Tip 25C, break down the face into planes to help you visualize it in a 3D space. Tip 25D, hair doesn't just sit on a person's head like a cheap party city wig, it grows from the head. Remember to add baby hairs and sideburns when appropriate. Tip 25E, 
Hair is also flowing and doesn't stay in one place like nasty ass tracks off of eBay. To help visualize this, break down the hair into sections and add flowing lines. Tip 25F. Have no idea where to place ears? Here's an easy way to remember where they go. Ears are directly in line with your eye line. But anyway guys, that was my video, 25 drawing and painting tips and tricks. Let's give a big thank you to our sponsor today, Amino, and their new feature, Amino Stories. If you could, please head on over to my Amino page, watch my stories, and give them a heart or a comment if you are so inclined. Bow down to the Amino Overlord who, with the sponsorship, is giving me the ability to pay for Sweet Osa's upcoming coming surgery. She is going to have a tooth that is infected. It's like a way back molar and it's chipped and the chip got infected and oh, it's just a bunch of bad news bears from my baby. And then she's also got a little tumor, benign tumor on her like waterline on her eye and it drives her nuts. So I took her in to get that removed and that's when they found the, the tooth and the infection. So we've got a handful of things that we are going to take care of. I know it's going to be a very stressful day for all of us, but especially for my sweet baby doge. So um, it's not happening till September, but I have like this whole week planned of like spoiling the heck out of her before she goes into surgery. So if you guys have any fun big doggy activity ideas, please leave them in the comments down below. Also, please let me know uh, which, if any of these tips were the most mind blowing for you. I'd be really, really curious to find out. I realize that some seasoned artists will go through this list and be like, I knew that, but this really isn't for the super seasoned professional artist. This this is for the beginner artist. This is for the intermediate artist, uh, the hobbyist, if you will. But anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching and don't forget to stay out of trouble. See you guys later. Mm -hmm.